keep in mind that the real money is in the second loaf. Lower one day is Thursday, October 3rd, 2024. And this is the week in charts. I just want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So what are we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. I have a lot to say about that. Been really choppy lately and mixed. I guess I could save you some time. <laughs> your questions on trading, your favorite stock and crypto picks. We'll get to the live charts in a few minutes. This week, I'm going to focus on the methodology in action. We have a new mystery chart. We have a smoke report, which is always exciting. And uh, I do a brief 10% TFM 10% update. I have the altcoin trade update. Unfortunately, it stopped out. And then uh, I'm going to touch briefly on Landry 100. I only have one thing, I think, or maybe two, a rehash of one for a million little things. And that'll make sense in just one second. This is Claim Screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as often summing up, all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can have between now and then. There's all my contact info. Feel free to shoot a screenshot of that if you're watching this video or watching recorded of it. You could also reach me at daviddavelander.com. All right, let's talk about the mystery charts and the methodology in action. So let's first do a follow-up. And this is our smoke and report. I wish I could bring you one every week. I guess if I could, you might not see my fat ass again. This was CLOV. This is the recommendation uh, based on the hypothetical 100K account. Obviously, adjust up and down depending on your account size. And I'll give you the spreadsheet if you want, or you can just put your information in and it'll uh, calculate the initial profit target if you know your entry and your stop. Anyway, it was in a nice uptrend. We, it was also a Landry Light pullback. It was, it was a couple of things. It was an accelerating momentum strategy. Notice how it was kind of in a gradual uptrend. And then it really began to blast higher. And then again, a Landry Light pullback. Also, this little pivot point in here, that makes it a trend pivot pullback. Anyway, pulling back to the moving average completes the pattern for the Landry Light pullback. I was talking to one of you guys earlier today. I had put a bunch of moving averages on a chart and in Bollinger last week at Bandcamp, a couple of weeks ago in San Francisco, I was talking about anchored Bollinger bands and just anchored moving averages and different things where you just pick a point on a chart and you start at that point. It's really good if you're doing some like intraday trading or something where you don't have enough data to give you a, a valid moving average. Anyway, it's something I've always wanted to do in IPOs and never got around to do it. I'm glad it kind of jogged my memory. I thought about programming something like if you had one day of data, a one day moving average, two day moving average until you get to your moving averages. But anyway, one thing I noticed, and, and it's not an original pattern, but the moving averages kind of squeeze down to the 30 EMA. And if you look at the Facebook group, I have a, a chart on that. And uh, different people have called it different things over time. But sometimes when you get those moving averages squeezing down, Landry Light pullback, same sort of type of pattern, same sort of type of analysis. But anyway, with these defined pullbacks, like a Landry Light pullback, they're great for scanning purposes. But the bottom line is you still need to learn how to pick the best. Years ago, my first introduction to somebody else's methodology, I thought if it fit the bill of step one, step two, step three, then it was automatically a setup. And he explained to me, no, it's, there's a lot more to it than that. So I think it's okay to scan for setups. And I think Landry Light pullback, so that squeeze thing I was just talking about or whatever, could be a valid thing to do. But... Number one, I think it's better to look at a lot of charts. And number two, your stock picking will get better if you do look at a lot of charts. And as I preach, I look at upwards of a couple thousand charts every day. Nick, uh, we'll talk We'll talk about that in one second. Um, I'm glad you brought it up. Anyway, the entry was here, stop was down here, and the initial profit target was here. Now, like I said last week, we got into this position, and at one point we were up $400, and then at another point we were down $360. So it was quite a swing in equity. And that's on 100K. And then earlier today, when I take this snapshot, the entire position was up uh, 2060. Oh, at the peak, at least. Uh, I think it's made a higher high since then. But anyway, at the, at the peak today, it was up $2,060. So lots of swings in there. Uh, this is an example of seeing each position to its fruition which I'm going to talk about or beat to that horse again on in a few minutes. So not going well so far, so good. Now here's my actual trade. 
And when I first saw 299, when I was grabbing a screenshot, I'm like, well, hang on, Dave. Entry was three. Why'd you do that? So I did a little forensics, and I'll show you why I did that. And notice that the IPT was four. And I was watching it this morning, and this thing blasted higher over these two bars. Let me just back this out and show you. It blasted higher so fast that I was nervous that it wasn't going to get to four or beyond. So I was watching, and it installed out just a smidge. I went ahead and bailed out just a tiny bit early. And so I got a little bit less than that $1,000 that I want on the first loaf, per 100K at least. But I had, I had enough. I had so many shares on of this. I have it in other accounts too. But I have so many shares. I was very happy to take sort of a gift horse because I didn't know whether or not it would make that initial profit target or not. And if you look at this trade, the time I made this trade, I also put a post in the Facebook to let everybody know that it was getting close enough. Anyway, so just to show that I wanted to make sure make sure that you know I didn't front run this setup by getting in at 299 when the entry was three. I do remember now, and after I looked at the chart, looked at the time that I entered, the setup triggered, but then came immediately back in. So I was watching on a trigger, and I forget exactly how. I probably had an alert at three. And it hit the trigger, and it came right back in. So I was like, okay, Dave, let me put a little discretion on this. And I went ahead and put in a re-trigger right around 290, well, at 299. In case it came back up, I would, I would get triggered in on that. So that's why I got in a little early. I actually got in right here on this bar here and I took a second entry. So I figured that if it was gonna bust, if it was gonna bust through, it was gonna make it to three again, it would bust through. So I went ahead and put an entry at 299. So just, just an FYI, and that's why I did what I did. Uh, Linda Rasky was asking me, was the first, <laughs> Linda Rasky asked me a question, I was all excited. At, uh, it was kind of a pinch me moment, once again, at band camp at <laughs> the TS, AASF, uh, it's the San Francisco Technical Analysis Society. Great society, TSAASF.org, I believe. And you don't have to be a resident of San Francisco to join. They do a lot more and more they're doing online. And what's cool is, and, and I don't know about future presentations, so check with them, but this whole seminar was recorded and also I think broadcast live for members. And there was no fee. And if you've ever been to one of these things, there's a lot of expenses in putting these on. And it's usually like six or seven hundred dollars. Even if it's a, a private organization, it's that much per person to attend. It's ridiculous just because of the expenses that are involved. But uh, they, they, they've kept the cost down. And somehow, I don't know how, but they're able to give it to you for free. Uh, with no additional costs other than your yearly membership, which is like a hundred bucks, which is uh, nothing. Right. For for all you get out of it, at least. Anyway, a little plug for those guys. I love those guys. I've spoken there three times or four times, three times over the last 15 years. But anyway, so here's how I played it. I got a little bit less than that thousand dollars I wanted on the first loaf in this particular account, at least. This is my model account. I try to model out the trades here so I could show them and teach them. Good, bad, and a different, obviously. So keep in mind that the real money is in the second loaf, the second half of the trade. So I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully. I'm in this stock for a long, 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 long time. Jeff was talking last week. He's been in, uh, I don't know if you're here or not tonight, Jeff, but when did we trigger into that ARLP? 2020 or something like that? I think it was 2019. It was long before COVID, if memory serves. And he's still in that position and he's done exceptionally well. We got stopped out and going to watch last week's uh, Dave Landers Week of Charts for a lot more than that. But anyway, that's where the real money is. I, and I did that preaching, I think, last week or week before about uh, longer term trends and, and how to make the, the real money in the markets. Now, when we hit the initial profit target, we move our stop to break even. And by the way, I'm going to mention this in a second, but I'm, I can go ahead and cover it now. Somebody was asking me a lot of questions about stops. I've been getting a lot of questions about stops lately and how to set them. And there's only two questions you need to ask yourself. If if you're a member of DaveLeonard.com, there's a lot of stuff behind the firewall on stops. So go in and watch all that. If you've been a member a while, you should have trading full circle. And the gentleman who asked me about stops, if he doesn't have it, let me know. And we'll see where you are and getting that. We'll get it to you. But the bottom line, you need to ask yourself, how far away 
does my stop need to be to ride out the normal volatility of the market? Now, this was an extremely high HV stock. Yeah, 117 is the HV now. And that's pretty crazy. That's um, SP 500. We'll look at it in a second. I think it's like 14 or 15 if it's that high. So you need to be outside of that normal noise. And I know about a 25% stop seemed kind of ridiculous on this one, but that's what it called for. That's the type of move that it makes. And if you're not outside that normal noise to ride out at least a short term movement in the market, because we're looking to get that swing trade profit out, hopefully soon, then you're gonna get stopped out of noise alone. And the second question is, where would you be wrong? Without going into a lot of details, because we can pick this up again next week once I find all those questions. But where would you be wrong? Let's say this was a, a short, a transitional pattern. If it went on to make new highs, you would definitely be wrong there, okay? So that's the worst case scenario. So maybe try to improve upon it from there. Maybe you get a little bit fairly close to that high to give it enough wiggle room so it has time to roll over if it's gonna roll over. Same thing for buy, if you're buying a transitional pattern off the lows. If it goes to new lows, obviously you're wrong. It's no longer making a transition. It's going back to old lows. So those are kind of easy to kind of figure out, but the pullbacks is, how far do you give it if it keeps pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, pulling back? So again, you want to be outside the normal noise of the market and you want to look at a spot where you would have failed. In this particular case, if it pulled all the way back to two, then that would look like a failure in the pullback. That also puts you all the way back to this prior breakout. So that's how I set the stop on that one. I tend to eyeball it and over time you'll get better and better at this and you can just kind of eyeball them. But you always have to put the the market's risk and not your risk or keep the market's risk and not your risk in mind so yeah i only want to risk a few percent on each trade but guess what risking a few percent i'm going to get stopped out of noise alone i, I did some s g trading today and i want to kick myself in the butt for doing it because it was stupid and when i when you ever make a trade and you know you make it a stupid trade when you make a stupid trade <laughs> you know uh so I, I write shame and i made like a shame trade i, I tried to get into a uh a leverage etf and use like a 10 cent stop on something that bounces around like crazy and it was stupid and i didn't lose much but it was just it just felt like it just felt like i was just throwing money out the window because it, it all happened within about 10 minutes you know so it was stupid well and i knew that i was within the normal noise so make sure you're outside the normal noise the only other thing that that he was asking me about was something like hv HV kind of gives you um, kind of a wake up call. So you're looking at something like this is HV in the triple digits. You know it's going to be super volatile. So you know you're going to need a really wide stop. And if you were statistically to set those stops based on historical volatility, I no longer, I no longer have the formula, I think, for like telechart or anything like that. But I think the formula is buried somewhere in Metastock. But those stops based on historical volatility are extremely, extremely, extremely wide. So they're so far, they're so crazily wide that you couldn't you you couldn't uh, trade at those levels. So that's the point I was making there. So use it as a guideline, but not a specific thing. Hopefully that made some sense. And and I'll, I'll pick it up next week. I didn't mean to get in all these details. These are some of the details I was going to cover next week. Anyway, uh, we have a mystery chart this week. This is a Landry Lights pullback. You can see it was in a, once again, kind of a nice gradual trend, okay? And then it began to accelerate higher. It has not touched its, except for yesterday or today, or, uh, this happened today, I think. It has not touched the, the 30 EMA and 40 days, thereabouts, which is pretty impressive. And then it pulled back to 30 EMA and Landry Light goes back to zero. So this is a decent looking setup. It's a little wide and loose, much longer term, but it's really gotten its act together over the last several months. And that's why I like it. Entry is here, stop is there. Once again, uber wide stop, okay? But if you look at the chart, you know, forget about the price action on the side, you know, get, get rid of the scale on the side. And that doesn't look like it's that far away. I'm pointing to my screen like you've seen me point to the screen. So that's what it calls for, okay? And you know, setting stops really isn't rocket science. What I would recommend you do is just two things. One, get better at stock picking. That goes for me too. It's like deliberate practice is what you need to do when you're looking at charts. If you see a chart take off, 
then look at the chart and say, was there one of my patterns there? Should I have caught this setup? And it's going to make you a better and better trade. Sometimes just for no reason whatsoever, stocks go up. Okay, you don't know what catalyst might have kicked in or what happened or who bought it or or who dumped it or whatever, you know. But look at a lot of charts. And the other thing is I would err on the side of having them a little bit on the wide side, especially if you're a little newer to trading, but compensate by trading fewer shares. It's just the opposite of what everybody tells you. Everybody tells you to use tight stops. No, use fairly loose stops, okay? But take your share size down, especially if you're new to trading. And I guarantee you, oh, I can't guarantee it. I can't guarantee anything in this business, right? I guarantee your chances of catching a winner will go up, even if your stock selection is it fantastic at this level, at your level, whatever. But you will catch a few winners, and then catching a few winners helps you to get the reps in. And that's another thing that I want to get into, too, is, is getting the reps in. I've talked about it before, and I want to revisit that quite a bit. But anyway, loosen your stops a little, especially if you're getting stopped out a lot. Somebody told me a while back, there was a couple of gentlemen. One was like 20 or 19. The other was 21. They got stopped out. 20 something times in a row, 19 or 20 something, times, whatever it was, because it's more than one person. This has happened kind of over and over again over the years. And they're doing two things wrong. Their stops are too tight or their stock selection could use a little help. Okay. Now, loosening your stops, I have fixed, so to speak, a lot of people just by talking them into loosening their stops on positions. Anyway, I went way on a tangent. I did it sit on God on, but uh, I just want to let you know that I didn't forget about your question. All right, TFM 10% system. Let me just cover this real quick. These are 5%. Within 5% is the green zone of the 50-week closing high, and that's where we are now. And you can see we made a 50-week closing high here, and then here, and then here, and then here, and then here. That was last week. This is a weekly chart. So last week we made a 50 week closing high in the S&P 500. So the top of the green zone, which would be 100% of a 50 week closing high was hit last week. That moves the green zone up. The bottom of the green zone is 5% away from the 50 week closing high. And then the pink zone is more than 5% away and then 10% is more than 10% away. So there's the rules right there. Just a drop below the pink, hot pink zone, which is 10% and a 50-week simple moving average. Now, it's kind of interesting. I'm just noticing this in a live chart. We're getting really, really close to take it out that 10% level with the 50-week moving average. So if the 50-week, it's the greater of the 50-week moving average or the 10% line, okay? And or another way of looking at it, it has to close below both. But once the 50-week moving average gets above the 10% line, and that's just a little whipsaw filter, then the 10% line becomes the trigger. And we're getting fairly close to that. I asked the client for permission <laughs> to beat him up. And I was waiting for his answer. I'm going to do it anyway. You'll see that. That'll make sense in one second. So the last cell was right here. Close below the moving average and below the 10% line. And then the last buy. Buy is a little more stringent. Two bars of Landry light. And a close above the 10% line. Okay. And it's a simple little system, but sometimes I get tripped up and I take a lot of questions on this. And I've been um, working with somebody on Twitter quite a bit on that too. So feel free to ask questions on these things. In fact, I would encourage you to. Anyway, so that's the sell would be below, below the 10% line and below the 50 week moving average, which again is catching up. Here's the NASDAQ trade I took. The stop would be right now below the 50-week moving average, but that's catching up the price. And then after, once it does get above that 10% line, then again, 10% would be the sell on that. So the sell right now is like 437. You can see we made a 50-week high back here, but unlike the P's, we haven't made a new high. So the top of the zone remains flat. In fact, all three of the zones remain parallel at this point. I guess they were always parallel, but Horizontal. <laughs> anyway, so you can see it lost like 700 bucks since last week. And that's the thing with longer term trend following is if you watch the zigs and zags, it'll make you kind of crazy. And I'll just show you those in just one second. 
But anyway, this silly little position I thought was going to be like just for S and G's. Ah, I buy 100 shares and I'll tell everybody, you know, I put on 100 shares based on the signal. Let's see what happens. And I, I'm very happy it's worked out as it has. But it's like, wow, it's like went up 50 percent. Nobody would ever dream that you get in something like the Q's and be up 50 percent in what's that a year or so, year and change, <clears throat> just a little over a year. But anyway, like I said last week, when you are in longer term trend following, and again, we do scale out as you just saw a few minutes ago. And I know I repeat myself a lot, but there's a lot of new people coming in and I get a lot of the same questions over and over. But if you're trading a pure trend following system like this one with no money management other than signals to get in and out, okay, then the drawdowns will be pretty abysmal. And that one was pretty painful, $8,000. And I think where it is now, it's right around $6,000 should that get hit. So that's the TFM 10% system. So far, so good. There's been many times where I wanted to bail on this, but I decided to just stick with it. And also, the great thing about this little simple system here is I've thought the market was pretty iffy, and, and it's still a little iffy here and there, as you'll see in one second quite a bit. And I never would have held on to a position uh, based on some of that iffy action with this longer term trend following. Now, individual positions, yeah, I just follow the plan. I know. All you got to do is follow the plan. Easier said than done. And we'll get to that in a second. But as far as like a longer term trend following system, I've forgotten how painful it was. I cut my teeth on these longer term systems many, many years ago. I did a lot of mechanical testing and trading. Anyway, last week I talked about this Osmo trade, and I just bought this when it broke out. And as I'll cover it just one second, I'm not a breakout trader, but in these shit coins, sometimes when they take off, that's HYT, you could just buy the breakout, buy the strongest ones, and I use a 20% initial profit target. Now, as I discussed last week, I mined off, so to speak, $25 of Bitcoin, not to rehash too much or beat the dead horse i looked into actual mining because i'm a nerd and i like that kind of stuff and uh, i realized very quickly that at least with our cost of power which is much lower than the rest of the nation shockingly it's much higher than it used to be when i lived in the country but anyway uh the cost of power it would not be prohibitive you could buy a used one on ebay uh and maybe even a new one for a few hundred dollars and you plug it in, it would lose about 10 bucks a day, <laughs> just burning electricity for, for no purpose. So anyway, so I came up with the brilliant idea of as I make money in these shit coins, mine off a little bit while they're going higher into Bitcoin, just like $25 here and there for shits and giggles. And to my surprise, it's actually added up a little bit. Now, take a look at this trade, which is a great example of why that tiny bit of scaling out works. Now I wouldn't I wouldn't scale out more than half, okay? Uh, or half and half again. For instance, you take off half of this initial profit target and I just use 20% in these shit coins to keep the math easy. Eventually I will probably have to adjust more for volatility. But anyway, I, I wouldn't take off like another half or anything like that, but just take off a few bucks here and there when this thing is is blasting higher so it was down at 48 cents and it ran to uh almost 70 cents so, so it's, that's a pretty impressive run 40 something percent run over a short period of time a few days so i feel like it's worth doing this and now i'll have the bitcoin forever not that i want to buy and hold but with just little nickel and dime stuff it doesn't really matter now whenever this this little mining experiment gets up to something substantial, then yeah, I'll probably need to do some some money management on that. But it's just a fun thing to do. Now, truth be told, and that this could be one of the million little things. This this one actually dropped a little further than I planned, and I thought I was stopped out, but I found out that I wasn't. And I don't know what happened. I don't know if I had an order in place or something. And uh, for some reason, it it, it kept on. Uh, I ended up with more of this than I thought I had, but I did get out and I think that's a sell right there. So um, kind of a scratch uh, on the, or not much more than a, than a scratch on a second loaf on that, but better than the poke in the eye. Now, just real quick, the Landry 100, this is just a proof of concept. I'm just buying new highs 
so to speak. Everything I've showed you so far, the clove trade, the shitcoin trade, and uh, you know, not never say never, but I will never show you anything that I haven't already actually done. And in most cases, I have showed the setup ahead of time. For instance, that mystery chart I showed, if that triggers tomorrow or the next day or whenever, I will follow up on that position in upcoming shows. And that's actually in my trading service as a setup for tomorrow, davelander.com slash trading service. If you want to see the archives, davelander.com slash archives. You can see the archives, warts and all, including that clove trade soon. I'll update them first chance I get. Now, this is more of an experiment, more of a proof of concept. And I ran this years ago, ran it, so to speak. And it did exceptionally well, although it did get whacked every now and then. And I stopped doing it for various reasons because it was work. But then I, I'm, I'm sorry that I did because it's a really good experiment. And it does get you looking at this, the momentum in the markets. And you'll, you can actually see the ebb and flow of the sector action coming and going within, within the list. And that's kind of a cool thing, too. I know you want to party with me. But all of these were bought at new highs. And I don't know how hard that is to read, but that's 93%, 50%. These are all 40s and 30s. And this was all started, uh, I think, on May 30th. I rebooted this. And you could see that some of the dates in here. And this one was entered on at the end of July. And it's up 100% or thereabouts since. Now, there's no money management in this. I just take them out as they lose momentum or if they go negative for a while and the other thing i do is i let new like i wasn't going to make any changes in tonight's list but when i looked at my new highs list i found four of them that i really liked so i added those four in and if you're in uh, facebook i could publish a list there and uh maybe tweet it out too anyway so that's just sort of a, a again a proof of concept and if we get into, God forbid, a choppy, choppy market or worse, a bear market, then cash, I treat cash as an asset class in this list. So I'll start, the, there'll be slots for cash and then the rest will be any stocks. And I might, I won't do inverse ETFs for, because there's a bad decay problem with those. We can get into that at some point in time. I talked about it in the past, but they all go to zero eventually. For instance, SQQQ non-split adjusted was, I think, don't quote me on this, but I think it was over five hundred thousand dollars a share when it when it came public, and now it's um, where is it? Uh, anybody know where it is? Around ten bucks a share now, or something like that. So again, they all go to zero. Okay. Now here's a question I received. Now he was looking at this chart and asking about a breakout on this particular stock. Now, keep in mind, I'm a pullback trader with the exception of IPOs. There's a little bit of a breakout characteristic there. I'm buying new closing highs in IPOs and this proof of concept Landry list. I'm actually trading the IPOs and then also the shit coins. I'm actually playing the breakouts there, but I do not play breakouts as a general statement in stocks. So to answer his question, no, I would wait for a pullback. I wouldn't just buy a stock because it's persisting. Now, as I think I said in prior weeks, maybe in my next life, if I feel like I'm to a point where I want to back off a little bit on trading, maybe I'll just run that Landry 100 as a private portfolio, and then I'll go off and have some fun. But I enjoy doing this, so I don't see me doing that for a while. <laughs> I also enjoy a lot of this stuff, too. So. But anyway, yeah, you want to wait for a pullback. Once you have something on your momentum list, you want to wait for a pullback. And uh, that got me thinking. So I took a look at this, and this is actually in my Landry 100. And I actually bought right there. Now, I, would, I wouldn't just willy-nilly buy a stock of new highs. Again, not to beat the dead horse, but I wouldn't just do that. However, if you're keeping a list of these things, if you're a big portfolio of 100 stocks, then you can do it. As I explained in prior webinars, a lot of times you're getting these things and they immediately get whacked. And if you were trying to do three or four or five stocks, buying a new highs, you'd, like, you'd likely get whacked on several of them and get knocked out and give up. It'd be a horrible way to try to trade. 
But if you're doing a hundred of these stocks, okay, in a big portfolio, then it's pretty easy. It's like, okay, I've whacked on that one. Let's see how it shakes out. If it doesn't come right back, then I'll bail on it. And, and you can go into some of those 50 and 60 and 70, 80% gainers and 90% gainers and notice that they probably did get whacked at some point, either when they first got into the put put it put into the portfolio or somewhere in between. All right, let me check on my YouTube brethren real quick. I'll be right back. Questions, what are your thoughts on using trend lines specifically for buy points? Um, we get the live charts, we can talk about that a little bit more. I don't actually use trend lines for buy points. I might put a trend line in to show the acceleration of the trend. Uh, my buy point would be above the pullback for all the pullback trades. That's a core methodology. What I show in a trading service, those are all pullbacks. So that would be, so I don't actually use them specifically. I, I don't go crazy drawing a whole bunch of trend lines. Every now and then I get a chart from somebody and they get trend lines from like six years ago. And that might see, still be relevant, but you've got so many lines on the chart. It just creates a lot of mass confusion. But if you're going to do trend lines and uh, we could we go to, we get to the live charts, I could draw a couple for you. But just keep it really, really simple. And I, I tend to just eyeball these type of things. I've done a, I started a series a while back on a million little things. And now I think it's just going to be um, a segment of the show each week. So I just have one I want to cover in particular this week and a couple of thoughts. And the point I, I'm making with this million little things segment is that everyone thinks this big epiphany is going to happen where you get anointed and uh, you're a trader all of a sudden. And it doesn't really work that way. It's, there's not like a huge epiphany you're going to have, but you're going to have a tiny, a bunch of tiny little epiphanies. And hopefully I'll help you get there by saying things but like I said earlier, like loosen your stops a little bit, but adjust for the volatility. Adjust, adjust your share size down to keep the risk the same, adjust for risk, okay? So lots and lots of little things like that. Number 747,158, make sure that you need the money. I should have said, make sure that you don't need the money. <laughs> So here again is the CLOV, a client of mine uh, and I were texting each other. I, I, I no longer ask him if he has certain stocks because he'll tell me uh, if he does or does not. And he told me, he said, I effed up again. I needed money in that account to buy something. I was going to call his broker after I sold it for 281. Worse yet, I looked up at 317 today. That was a few days ago. It had the money to buy and hesitated. F me, doing really well again, but this pisses me off, LOL. So, and, and I'm picking on this guy and I, I texted him, hopefully I, I didn't have a chance to read what he wrote, but we go back and forth and I admit a lot of uh, mistakes to him too. So it, it's a two-way street, but it, it exemplifies the point of how it really is a million little things. And he, he needed the money out of this one account or in his case, I think he chose to take it out of this one account. And that's a that's a bad idea. You can't go into a trade and need money because if that trade goes against you and he may have, he sold close to the low, which sucks. I know that, but you know, and, and again, the thing about looser, looser stops, right? If you were using a stop around 275 or 281 when he got out, you would have gotten knocked out on, on just this little correction and noise alone. If you go back in and watch all the archives, if you can't sleep at night, you'll see that it's like, hey, this stock is it's not, I'm not happy that it's not going up, but it hasn't done anything wrong. And the point I was making, and it's a little hard to see in this spread out chart because it looks really spread out, but that's only a couple of weeks. And it, 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 pulled back, it rallied up a little bit, and then just kind of consolidated a little bit. Longer term, it's still an uptrend. Notice that it never even took out its 30 EMA, which is a great little reference point. But anyway, make sure you don't need the money. And nowadays, it seems like you always need money. Everything's so expensive. Now, number 100,286, revisited. Make sure that you see each position to its fruition. And that's also, a lesson in patience 
And also by saying see each position to its fruition, I mean, just follow the plan. I know it's easier said than done. And Linda was asking me, like, is it hard if I, I don't know if I got to the question earlier, but if I forgot to say it, is it hard for me to to show everybody what I'm doing? Because she said she likes to keep everything, um, she likes to keep her cards close to the vest. Well, for me, it actually helps me follow my plan. I may have been tempted to give up because, like I said the other day, it was kind of like a, chi a Chinese water torch. You're going down a few cents every day, a few cents, a few cents, and all of a sudden five cents. It's like, oh, damn. But what am I supposed to do? What am I telling my clients to do? Follow the plan. So my answer to her was it actually makes me a better trader because it forces me to follow the plan because if I show you a chart, I want to come back hopefully the next week and say, hey, look how this worked out. Good, bad, or indifferent. Hopefully good. Anyway, uh, this email reminded me that a lot of people probably gave up, unfortunately, on this trade. Now, you're going to have losing trades, okay? If I get rid of losing trades, you never see my fat ass again. And that's one thing that I've done before is try to figure out how to eliminate the losers. But then I realized that that is a holy grail hunt in and of itself. It's it's It comes with the game. You're going to have losers. And unfortunately, more than you care to. But I guarantee you a lot of people would not be able to hold to that. Now, what's interesting is, and I remember it felt like forever because of this Chinese water torture, right? To my surprise, that was only 14 days. Now, if this thing goes on for a year or two, let's hope, right? We can hope a little bit. You want to hope your profit gets bigger and fear that your loss doesn't get any bigger. That's that's okay to use that type of hope. But hopefully for this, for years and years and years, that 14 days is going to look like that much. And I know it's kind of hard to see that forest for the trees, but it is, it is a lot, a lot of patience. That's one thing I was going to get into tonight a little bit was patience. It's like you need patience to wait and wait and wait for a setup. It's been two weeks since I put a setup on and I, and I, I was feeling a little pressure for my clients. And it's like, no, I, I, I'm not going to put a setup on just to show you a setup. If I'm not going to put my capital in the harm's way, then neither should you. All right, let's shift gears and hop over to crypto. If there's any questions about anything thus far, let me know and I'll be happy to uh, cover it. But uh, we'll hop into crypto for a second here and then we'll take a look at stocks. So Bitcoin's been a real disappointment lately. And I put out a tweet a while back between 65 and 75. You see, I've got a drawing in 65 and 72. Lots and lots of overhead supply. As I preach, there's nothing magical about technical analysis, at least the way I do it. It's just performance-based trading, looking at charts, right? And then you're also reading the psychology of the players. So lots and lots of people have bought it between 65 and 72. And those people are likely looking to get out of break even. This is what happened here, especially after a spill like this. This thing sold off hard. Anybody who bought at 65 or higher is like, oh, it's back to 65, I'm out, okay? So that's not looking so good. So I would avoid Bitcoin for now. It's below the 30 as I preach each week. Never buy a market as a general statement if it's trading below its 30 EMA. Take a look at Ethereum. You could see it, it tried to break out a little bit from that 30 EMA, but then it rolled right back over. And if you look at Ethereum versus Bitcoin, it's really been abysmal. And there's your testament right there. Okay, if you were thinking about buying ETH BTC, and you just had that one rule. Okay, it did peep above it for one little day, but that's not enough to get too excited about. Obviously, you want to draw your big blue arrow, and it's pointing down, right? But as a general statement, look how much trouble it would have kept you out of. Okay, this thing went from what's up here, like five cents, all the way down to to three cents. So this thing just absolutely imploded, losing a tremendous amount of its value and never got above the 50, I, just, I mean the 30, it just amazes me. All right, uh, as I say quite often, sometimes when these markets are going, you could just buy the strongest ones. Right now, it's not really that time, although this one's up 32%, but you can see these long tails in here. This is um, very illiquid based on that action. 
And see, this one's up, but it's below the 30, and it's also in a downtrend still. That one looks okay. I think I bought this one last week during the seminar, doing the webinar, and I stopped out. So I'll have to look up that trade. I did say I would, I, my memory's been jogged now. So let me put a flag on this one so I can see it next week. So I know to do something with that. But yeah, I did stop out of that one. So it, it didn't make any money. That looks okay. See, this was trying to back out, uh, break out a little bit. Again, I'm not a breakout trader in other markets, but in these shit coins, when they're moving, they can go 10, 20% in, in a blink of an eye. This one looks pretty good. It's got some issues longer term, but see, this is more of a core methodology. You've got a nice, nice uptrend followed by a pullback. By the way, the shit coins is a really good way to get your reps in, okay? There was a gentleman, and I'm, I'm trying to track him down, if you're watching the YouTube or whatever, but there was a gentleman that was in the seminar, and, and he seemed to be really struggling with his trading. And one thing that I would tell him is, as crazy as it sounds, put like a thousand bucks into a, a, a shitcoin account and take like $50 trades or $25 trades, maybe risk $10, $20 on these things, buy a tiny, tiny, tiny amount and get the reps in. And if you're successful for six months doing this, then up your ante by just a tiny bit more because you've proved that you can follow a process and follow the plan and so on and so forth. But this looks pretty good. This is a nice little pullback here in that one. And I'm kind of violating my old rules. Uh, everything would just look crappy for a while. So it's like I forget to do my analysis sometimes on these things. But that one looked good. Let me put a, uh, which, which one was that? Let's go back to that one. Not that one. Let me put a flag on this one. In fact, let's take a look at this. Let me go ahead and buy some of this so we can talk about it next week. Let's see. All right, so we'll go ahead and buy this one. Just going at the market. All right, so I'm long this one at 109, 109.3. So 109.3, so I'm long right there. Now 20% for an IPT, start the fill come in. 109 times 1.2 equals, let's say a buck 31, okay? So let's, we'll put in a limit order for half at a buck 31. I'm gonna sell half at 131. And then I'll put a marking on my chart to know, okay, so this trade is now set up at one, is that right, 131? Wow, it's only gotta go, not much, huh? So right now, again, I haven't adjusted for volatility. So in this case, that would just be, a, that'd be a 20% move from there to there. How crazy is that? I'll put an alert on that too, so it gets hit. Go to the webinar, that'd be great. There you go. All right, we're in that. I'll show the actual trade next week if you want. Just uh, remind me and hold me to it. All right, let's go ahead and shift gears. Any questions on these altcoins? All right, I'm going to shift over to the stocks. All right, so like the question of trend lines, I just kind of eyeballed. But you can see like in the case like the Clover, you can see it worked its way higher and then accelerated higher. So I wouldn't actually, I don't even draw the lines per se. I mean, if you go to draw a trend lines, I like to draw lines through the bars. It, I just eyeball this mostly again, but you can see that's a very persistent move higher there. So I don't actually use trend lines for the actual buy points and things like that. I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. I know some people do that. I, I don't want to be skeptical, but I doubt they're doing it in real markets with real money. But that's just that's just my feeling. I could be wrong. Uh, you know, a lot of people say I don't, I, that I they that they don't believe that I'm doing this trend following more on stuff, but I promise you, I am. <laughs> all right, S&P 500 just choppy, choppy, choppy lately. I don't know if you guys have been watching it today, but it's been all over the place, and it seems like it's going nowhere fast. I was worried about this bear flag in here which is a bearish thing right you, when you see a market break out you want it to break out and keep breaking out and then correct down the road you don't want to see a market break out and go like eh. you know it's just not a good thing so there's a bear flag not the end of the world it's not like a like a huge sell signal but it is slightly bearish and we did, we did get a knockout move out of it we did sell off out of it which is a good thing which will negate the pattern if we can make new highs. Now, it's a bad thing if we come below 56.50 round numbers because that's our breakout point. So S&P 500, 
keep an eye on 56.50 and then keep an eye on 57.60-ish. Those are your inflection points. You don't always get inflection points, but I know everybody wants an inflection point. So in that case, that's your inflection point. NASDAQ Composite doesn't look as good or as well. You can see it's stalled out in this retrace rally. It has a one, two, three retrace. It has a bit of a Gartley look to it. I'm, I'm not a fan of a Gartley pattern. I, I I have to be able to wrap my head around. I gave away all my books, and I know there was a book that had the Gartley pattern, some other stuff in it. And if one of you guys that's here tonight or on Facebook has the book, look it up and see if there's any psychology behind the pattern. Because to me, you show me a bunch of you know, these butterfly-looking patterns and stuff, it doesn't mean anything to me unless I can kind of wrap my head around the psychology of it. Now, as far as this retrace psychology is, it's kind of like the break even thing, okay? Like I said earlier, or recently I should say, oh, I said earlier about Bitcoin, people looking to get out of break even. If you take a look at like the Russell, I have a, a friend from the gym that's in the Russell and the other day he's like, oh, I finally broke even for one day. And he's, he's still itching to get out of this trade that he's been in for years just to get out of break even. And I said, don't sell when it's going up, sell when it's going down. It's hard for people to wrap their head around that. Anyway, let's take a look at gold, the commodity, doing pretty good in here. The radio guys are finally right, but then now you have to wonder why would they be selling you the gold if it's going higher? That's another argument for another day. Gold stocks, not quite as, don't look quite as well. You can see they're kind of all over the place, but they have worked their way higher. We might see some setups here fairly soon. Software, just kind of all over the place, really going nowhere fast, bumping up against these old highs. At least see a breakout, not look back for a while. If you take a look at drugs, so like I said in the market a minute this morning, it's a bit of a tale of two markets. You got some areas like drugs, which have given up 100% of their recent breakout so that's a bit of a bummer okay and then you got some other areas like defense i guess all these wars and all <laughs> are helping that along looking pretty good nice uptrend so far just pulling back we could some, see some setups there fairly soon energies have been one of the areas on the downside although they began to improve greatly today you can see energies have been a really choppy downtrend especially the oil service stocks, and they're still in a choppy downtrend. Although energies overall had a pretty good day today, but that's wide and loose on all the places. Nothing for me there. Before I forget, bonds got whacked pretty hard today. Bonds are a bit of a bummer. They were kind of taking off in here. Bonds up, rates down, right, and then they begin to roll back over. So that's that kind of sucks to put it mildly. Let's just see how that shakes out. Home builders, none of these areas, not too far from all time highs. So that's that's kind of interesting. In spite of rates, I guess the I guess the I'm gonna confuse the issue with facts. I guess the housing trumps <laughs> the rates at this point. I know for a while nobody in the right mind was building a house because of the rates. Speaking of real estate, real estate's looking pretty good. So far, just pulling back in here. Nice, nice uptrend. Never thought I'd get excited about REITs, but hey, it looks starting to look like a momentum stock in here. Oh, by the way, we were talking about the, the volatility of markets. Okay, the spiders are at 16, okay? So the REITs are at 16 or 14, so that's not too far away. So the spiders are at 16 and CLOVs at 107 or something like that. So that gives you uh, a gauge of, of the volatility, about uh, eight times more volatile than the S&P 500. So maybe that'll help you help to wrap your head around that your stop needs to be fairly loose in the case like that. Utilities just banged out new highs recently, just off of all-time highs. Nice uptrend intact there. And again, utilities starting to act like momentum stocks, which is kind of cool. Semiconductors back to the eh or meh. You can see they're kind of all over the place. They stalled out in this retrace rally. They tested it one more time and got thwarted. So that's a bit of a bummer. So the bottom line is as you go through all these sectors on your own. Just notice how mixed the action is throughout. Some are doing okay, some are chopping around, and some are in bona fide downtrends. All right, any individual stocks you guys want me to take a look at real quick? How about you guys on YouTube? Anybody there want to 
individual stocks you want me to take a look at? I know that the Facebook group, group kind of, since we do talk about stocks here quite often, has uh, usurped the questioning on stocks. Anything? Gone once, gone twice. Well, obviously, I want to thank everybody for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Anything on the answer? Dave at Dave. Landry.com. I think most everybody here tonight's also in Facebook, so I'll see you there tomorrow. Oh, we're getting some stocks in. All right, that always happens. <laughs> All right. Air AIR or AUR? AUR. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. Let's see what's going on here. Let me get a let me see if I get a, a blank chart on that one. The only thing, a couple things here, it's obviously super volatile, okay? HV of 99, not that we won't trade a high volatility type of stock. Okay, keep them coming. Okay, good, 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 good. Uh, I forget there's a lag on YouTube. My, my apologies for that. So I need to maybe call at the beginning of the presentation, do call for stocks picks. But yeah, it's it looks okay. I like this breakout here followed by this, but the more I look at it, the more I can kind of pick it apart. First of all, so you broke out past the prior highs, but it's only one bar in that breakout, okay? Yeah, I know it kind of worked its way higher in here, but it's just a one bar, kind of like a flagpole, and then it comes right back in. So I would pass just based on that in and of itself. And maybe I'm looking for too much perfection, but it just kind of shot up and came right back in. It's kind of one and done on the breakout, and then it's already retraced 100% of that breakout. It's a little wide and loose. It's not a clean breakout, but I think you kind of see where I'm headed with that. Let me see something real quick. Like the CLOV, notice that I was in a in kind of a decent, fairly clean uptrend for quite a while, and then notice that when it really began to take off, one, two, three, four, five, six, you had six bars of demand, so to speak, going up. So that's that's a great thing when a stock makes that move over days and ideally weeks or even longer. But this case was like that that momentum finally began to really kick in and accelerate. But when you get like just a one bar move out, and sometimes even a two bar move out, but or or two or three bar move, and that's it. I, I get a little leery on the fact that they might just come back in. And what I would encourage you to do, Stephen, is when you're looking at your charts, or I hope it's, or it might be, is it Stephen or Stephen? Uh, when you're looking at your charts, keep an eye out, and that's why I believe in looking at a lot of charts, a lot of charts, a lot of charts, but keep an eye out for that pattern of the one and done with the breakouts, a big one bar and then come back in. So watch that pattern. You can see a lot of those fail. So I'd be super careful with that. MSFT. And you want some moving averages on that? We could do that. We got that. Anybody from New Orleans? Doornax. My brother-in-law used to live near Doornax, and that was a, a wonderful field trip. Yeah, Microsoft, nothing to get excited about. Uh, Brian's point is we're down to the 200-day moving average. I guess longer term, you can see, look at the Landry light with that 200-day moving average. So that's a longer term uptrend. But to me, it kind of looks like a head and shoulders. Now, a head and shoulders is one of those patterns that I've seen enough of them to where I know that they work, so to speak. I don't actually trade them, but I use them as kind of like a bigger picture background, so to speak, of what's happening. So I see a head and shoulders here. This would be like a shoulder and kind of a complex head and shoulders. So shoulder, another shoulder here, head. And then the right shoulder is higher than the left. So this stock does not look good. It's wide loose at all the place, so I wouldn't trade it. But one thing you could think about psychologically, this, this is how I wrap my head around a head and shoulder pattern. You've got people buying it like right here, okay? And then it runs to new highs and then sells off hard. And they're like, oh, shoot. I'm going to get out of this thing if it makes it to back to new highs and if it gets higher than the prior high that where they may have bought in here on the shoulder then they think and then they're thinking like okay maybe i've dodged a bullet i'll just wait for it to get the brand new highs and then it begins to sell off again this looks like a big picture head and shoulders and i would i would leave it alone yeah that's nothing to do with um with this guy okay anymore going once going twice 
Well, thanks again, everybody. I, I'm truly humbled by your presence. I'm, I'm glad, uh, I'm very excited you guys are here. Hey, girls. Uh, if we don't talk again, uh, everybody have a great weekend and may the trend be with you. Thank you so much. You're welcome.